All right. This morning, we, uh, I know I've been in, I do series a lot. I feel that's uh, something I feel like God uses me with to, to help the church get a good, steady diet and what the Lord's saying to the church. But right now, um, we're in between some series. And so this morning, um, I, I began praying a few weeks ago and knowing this Sunday was coming up. I said, Lord, where is our church at? What are you wanting to say? What do you have for us today? And so this, the, the, the thought hit my heart, and the, the, I want to speak to you this morning on this thought, blind spots. How many of you have ever been driving down the interstate, tried to switch lanes, you thought everything was great, but as you began to merge, you're like, whoa, where'd they come from? And, and you had to swerve back real quick before you wrecked or you ran them off the road. And if you've ever taken driver's ed or if you've ever taken any kind of test, they always tell you that you can have a rear view mirror, you can have side view mirrors, but there's always those blind spots on your vehicle and that you really can't account for. That's why they made horns. Amen? And so as we're looking at this this morning, we're going to look at some blind spots that we have even in our own lives. Because we think we're doing good, we think we're living well, we think we, our Christian walk is where it needs to be, and then all of a sudden something happens, we're like, where in the world did that come from? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. <coughs> Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we're so honored to be in this place this morning. Thank you, Father, that we have a privilege to receive from your word. God, we're asking that this morning your word would sink deep into our spirits and into our hearts and minds, and you would help us to apply this word to our daily lives. And Lord, we resist the enemy. We come against the enemy right now in Jesus' name. We plead your blood over our minds and our hearts to receive everything you have for us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and roll that beautiful bean footage. I'm your blind spot. And my job is easy. Hide big things. You're good. And with your cut rate insurance, you could be paying for this yourself. So get all state. You can save money and be better protected from mayhem. Like me. Mayhem is everywhere. So get an all state agent. Are you in good hands? I'm not promoting all state, but how many of you know? That mayhem is always on your in your right there where you can't see it. That guy's little wicked face in that video right there reminded me of the wicked schemes of the enemy. You think you're cruising along and you're doing well, and you start to make a you start to go this way or that way, and that little that little face has just placed something right there in that spot that you can't see, only to derail you and to try to rob you of the destiny God's called you to. Amen. So blind spots, there's so much going on in our society, so much going on in our own personal lives, so much fear, so many distractions, so much turmoil, so much trouble. And we see in 1 Peter that he says, be sober. Well, in the original Greek, we get the word sober from the word sophronio. It means I am of sound mind. I am sober minded and I exercise self-control. So when we see that word be sober, it's not saying, well, you need to, not, you need to be sober from alcohol as well. But it's not, that's not what he's meaning. He's like, have self-control. He's, he's, this is what it's meaning. Have self-control. Be of a sound mind. Be sober-minded and exercise that self-control. It also goes on to mean properly safety-minded, having a sober outlook that reflects true balance. 
So right here in our text, it's telling us to be sober-minded, to have these things. So because Why? Because if we're not of sound mind, we're not going to be able to recognize someone who's roaring, walking, roaming around, acting and roaring like a lion. It's interesting that the Bible doesn't say he is a lion. He's an imposter. He's, he's sounding like a lion. And so we have to be sober-minded. We have to be mindful of that. What is a sound mind? Let's look at Rome, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We often quote this scripture a lot as Christians, but we often only quote that first sentence. Amen? The second sentence is, that, or the second part of that sit- sentence is that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. We get a little owie when the test of God comes sometimes, right? Every little test that comes our way. It's that by testing, we can discern what is the perfect will of God. How many of you want the perfect will of God in your life? You just ask God to allow a test to come. You can't pass it if you're not sober-minded. Blind spots. The devil is roaming around like a lion. He's increasing his efforts. You know why he's increasing his efforts? Because the, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back soon. Amen? Uh, two people believe that. <laughs> Come on, we've got to stop sitting there thinking, well, Granny said that many, many years ago, and we're still here. Look at your Bibles. Look at the events in this world. I'm not, it could happen today. It could. I'm not saying that it won't. No one knows, but we know the seasons. And as the church begins to engage, and as the church begins to move forward, and as the church begins to uh, push back the darkness in the region that we're in, this, the enemy is going to increase his efforts. And when you think you're walking along in life, I've got my praise on today, Shekinah glory, hallelujah, I paid my tithes. And when you leave the service, you and your wife's about to divorce because something came up in a blind spot that you weren't prepared for. Amen? Isn't it funny you get in fights before and after church? On the way and on the way home? You wonder why that happens. Just like in our cars, we, we have the best that money can buy today with our vehicles. On my, in my truck, I have this little cool thing that happens when I put it in reverse. This little camera shows up on my mirror to show me what's behind me. And then on my side view mirrors, I even have these little buttons I can push that defrost those mirrors so that it stays clear so I can see what's on the right and what's on the left and the window right in front of me. But nothing prepares me for those little areas that I can't see, those blind spots. And so this morning, we've got to look at some blind spots. And, and as we do, I want to share real quick, Caleb come to, brother, brother Caleb come to me in the middle of service and he said, Pastor, I just, uh, God gave me, a, he, I just saw this this morning, or actually this week, and he said, I saw our church, we were all in a big circle, and we were walking forward, and the reason we were all, all in this big circle was the, so that we could ex- get rid of the blind spots that we had as a church, and I was like, Caleb, do you know that I'm actually preaching on that this morning? Amen? So, praise God. So, as we're doing this, understand something this morning, nobody's alone. Amen? So we've got to look at some things when it comes to our blind spots. Number one, we've got to look at the blind spots in our walk with Christ. Blind spots in our walk with Christ. Last week we were talking about Pharisees, and Pharisees pretend that they have it all together, and they have masks, and they play act, right? They act like they've got it all together. But I'm going to tell you something, a wreck will really expose who you are in a heartbeat. Amen? A wreck. And so when it comes to these blind spots, if you, blind spots in your walk with Christ, if you don't have that circle like God showed Caleb, if you don't have that circle of people, if you don't have that good church family, that good church body, that brother, that sister that cares so much about you, that comes up to you and says, hey, I know you're doing well in this, but I don't know if you see this creeping in. That's blind spots. What is, a, what is one of the blind spots in your walk with Christ? Pride is, one of the, is a blind spot with your walk with Christ. Look at 1 Peter 5.5. 5, right before the scripture we just read, it says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, 
<clears throat> with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> Pride will always be a blind spot if we allow it to stay in our lives. Pride, if we allow it to get in, says, I, and I don't know why it is, but you can't tell men what to do when they're driving. Men, men don't ever ask for, come on, Moses wandered around for 40 years because he wouldn't ask for directions. You got a GPS? Nope, I know where I'm going. Honey, did you see that person about to hit you? I saw him, leave, him, leave me alone. You can't tell, uh, tell a man how to drive. I'm being honest, I'm a man and I know that. Too. I, I, I get so frustrated when people in my vehicle try to tell me how to drive. Because I've got this. But there's times, and I'm starting, maybe because I'm getting older, maybe, hopefully I'm getting a little more mature. There's times that I'll stop at a stop sign, and my truck is like at an angle because of the way the road is set up, and I can't see what's coming. Looking out the window with my son Jonathan's hair in the way. <laughs> so I'll say, and I just did this on this trip. We were in Waxahachie at Sagu. Hey, hey, buddy, is there anyone coming? I can't see. Now, Dad, you got it. Friends, we need that passenger that we trust, right? In our life, our life station person, we need that, right? That, said, that can see what you can't. But in pride, is, pride gets into our lives, and pride begins to say, I've got this figured out. I can ride solo. I don't need anybody helping me. I don't need anyone talking to me. I've got this figured out. Pride does that. Can I tell you this morning, and you can misquote me. If you misquote me, I'm going to punch you in the throat. God is a hater. Oh, what? Proverbs chapter 6 tells us all the things that God hates. The first, the first, one of the first things that God says he hates in Proverbs chapter 6 is he hates pride. He's a hater. He hates pride. He can't operate in someone's life who's prideful. Because prideful and humility, pride and humility are opposite. Humility is the key for anybody's life. Humility, amen? So yeah, God is a hater. He hates pride. And when we allow pride to come in, what we're doing in essence is really saying, I've got, I'm just going to put up these blind spots and I'm just going to let, I've got this figured out and I'm not going to worry about this or that. But I'm telling you, the Bible's very clear that pride leads to destruction. Humility. Humility. God gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And humility is, listen, I don't know where I'm going. My GPS is a little wacky. And so I stop and I ask, how do I get to this place? Come on, amen. Where's our, where's our older folks here this morning? Here they are. Let me tell you something. We can learn something, young people. It's okay to ask questions, right? It's okay to go and sit with some of these 65 and over or whatever and say, hey, how long have you been a Christian? How did you handle being a, a husband or a, a wife? And when I do premarital counseling, I make a couple sit down with someone who's been married longer than 30 years and I ask them to interview them because, come on, today we're like three years and I'm done. For some, they're like NBA, our college freshmen, one and done. It's, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to go to our, our elders as the Bible talks about and ask them questions about how or how did you get to where you're at in your walk with Christ? Amen? So, and we need that. And, and our elders need to be willing to do that. Amen? Humility is the key. We have to strengthen our relationships. You know, if I, if I didn't have a relationship with anybody that rides in my vehicle and I asked them, hey, is anything coming? If I was so prideful and arrogant, I know they don't want to die. But if I'm, if I'm so prideful and arrogant and I don't ask them, hey, I can't see what's coming around the corner, can you tell me? But if I'm prideful and arrogant, I'm going to kill all of us. Amen? Yesterday, we're driving back from uh, Sagu, and I can't remember what highway we were on because... That's kind of a long drive, but I'm going to get over. I'm riding by myself because ever all the cool kids wanted to ride with justice, and they don't think I'm cool anymore, I guess. But anyway, I'm driving, and I'm, I'm about to change lanes, and I think I've got it. And as I'm changing, this little motorcycle comes flying out of nowhere. 
It, you saw the, did you see the motorcycle? I, I freaked out. I went to merge, and that little motor, it kind of scared me. And as I let him go by, what I really wanted to do was chase him down and give him peace of my mind. Oh, my goodness, we're carnal. <laughs> as I switch lanes, and I'm thinking, I'm just, wow, God, that was pretty close. And I just right back to what we're talking about this morning, just begin to think about our lives. All these things that just come up out of nowhere. We have to strengthen our relationships because our relationships will help us expose the blind spots in our lives. David prayed that in Psalms 139, verse 23. Go there. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Then he said again in Proverbs or in Psalms, he said, prove me, O Lord, and try me and test my heart and my mind. That's Psalms 26, 2. David prayed that. Usually people don't recognize the blind spot until something awful has already happened. They have, when something awful happens, they wrecked. And isn't it, isn't it ironic that a lot of people won't even give their lives fully over to God until some crisis has happened in their life? And it, praise God that when anyone comes to Christ, praise God when anyone surrenders their heart and life fully to God, but friends, I'm telling you this morning, we do not have to wait for a crisis. We don't have to wait for something awful to happen. We can say, God, I want you to help me. I need good godly men and women in my lives to expose these blind spots. I want to strengthen my relationships, and I, don't, and I want my walk with you to be stronger today than it's ever been before in, in my life. Amen? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Amen? Every day with Jesus. And if, you're not, and if you're not strengthening your relationships with people, iron sharpens iron. I've never sharpened myself just by being by myself. Iron sharpens iron. I heard our men had a great time Saturday morning with men's breakfast. That's iron sharpening iron. I, we had people that went and last night just to go and have a great time laughing and being ministered to by Shonda Pierce. And you know, even though they weren't really probably on the bus ride there and the bus ride back, I haven't heard from any of them, but I'm sure no one stood up and said, hey guys, I had this awesome prophetic thought that God gave me, and I just want to just give it to you on this bus ride. Did that happen? But I know that what did happen, iron sharpened iron. Community was built. Relationships were made stronger. Amen? So people... Wait until they've been wrecked or they've been crashed. They've backed away from their walk and their relationship with Christ. They ignore the warning signs. They stay away from church and they stay away from the church family. And can I tell you this morning that any time you start to veer away, any time you start to uh, pull away and allow pride to take over and, and you start to entertain a thought, you start to entertain any type of sin, I promise you there's been a warning. I promise you God sent somebody to give you a warning. I promise you there was a caution, a, a yellow caution light that said, bridge out ahead. I promise you, because his word says that, when, that he makes a way of escape, amen? And that way of escape comes through brothers and sisters in Christ who love you so much that come alongside of you and say, listen, I know you're headed in that direction, but I want to just point this out. You have something creeping in. And you don't see it because it's a blind spot. Number two, we have blind spots in our relationships. Come on, we've got a. How many of you have been, ever been in a place where you know you took a relationship for granted? Relationship with dad, mom, uncles, aunts, mo husband, wife, you t kids. You took a relationship for granted. I picked up a, the, the Louisiana district's. Uh, newsletter this morning. Came in the mail while I was gone to Waxahachie. I picked it up. I opened up the front cover and I showed a list of people who they were honoring in memory of who pastors who had passed away this last year at district council at the end of this month. And right there was my dad's face. Like, wow. And I just sat there and it wasn't a sad thing. I was sitting there and I thought, I am so glad he and I did not take each other's relationship for granted. I'm so glad I never said, as busy as I get, I'm so glad I never said, you know what, I'm too busy to talk to my dad. 
I'm too busy to call back. Amen? Some, many people, even maybe some of you this morning, you've carried so much shame and guilt because you took for granted a relationship you had with a loved one and you wish you could go back and say, I love you one more time. But because of blind spots, you got tied up with doing life that you took relationships for granted. Can I tell you this morning, whatever relationship you have right now, please guard that, protect that, and don't ever take that relationship for granted. Your relationship with husband, wife, kids, whatever, is a gift from God. Amen? Guard it, protect it, love it. We can't assume that everything's, that they're always going to be there. We can't assume that they're always doing the right thing. We can't assume they're always making the right decisions. I was telling my wife last night in bed, we were talking about our oldest kid, and I said, listen, until he leaves my covering, I'm not assuming he has everything figured out. That would be a, a false assumption, wouldn't it? I've never met an 18-year-old who had it all figured out. I'm 43 and still don't have it all figured out. Come on. Amen? Some of y'all 80-something still don't got it all figured out. Be honest. Amen? I see blind spots. <laughs> when it comes to our relationships, you know, my wife, she's worked at a bank for many, many years. Honey, can I go to the bank and make a withdrawal if I've not put money in? No? She's quiet in front of y'all. She'd be at home. <laughs> I can't go to the bank. I can't write a check for money that's not in my bank. And so when it comes to relationships, if I'm not investing in the people that is around me, if I'm not investing, I'm not depositing into those relationships, you know, we have an awesome, awesome team of people here at this church who help serve in ministry. I can't, I can't withdraw something from them if I don't invest into them. Amen? I can't ask them to give me something if I'm not going to give them something first. Right? And so guess what? I as a pastor can't give if I'm not receiving from somewhere else. Someone, others are depositing into me because I have relationships with them. They're, they're, they're watching my blind spots and they're depositing into my life. And, they're, and then when they call me, hey, Jack, we need you to do this at district council for us. Can you do that? Absolutely. I'll be honored to serve in that. Thank you because you've poured into me and now you want to withdraw something from me? No problem at all. Come on. Amen. Are we tired because it's rainy outside? Wake up. So our relationships, we can't just take them for granted. We can't assume, I can't assume that um, the youth is going to absolutely just get whatever they need. I've got to be intentional, making sure Pastor Jessica has what she needs to be able to lead our youth group. I can't just assume that Brother Gerald or Sister Angela is just going to just fly with, off the seat of their pants and take care of the men and the women of the church. I can't just do that. I can't assume that anything's just going to happen. We have to be intentional with our relationships. We have to invest into those relationships. We have to spend quality time and quantity time with relationships. We have to listen. Come on, you got to understand this morning when it comes to relationships, there is a difference between hearing somebody and listening to somebody. How many of you have ever said to your kids, did you hear me? And they're like, I heard you, mom. But did you listen? There's a big difference. And that's with all of us. We have to listen, hear, and share. We have to, come on, we're so quick to point out the bad in everybody's problems. We're so quick to point out the negative things in people's lives, right? Well, you're doing this wrong, and you're doing that wrong. And yeah, I see you're a blind spot, but you know what? You're entertaining that blind spot. You kind of like that blind spot. We've been so good as a church in, Jesus, in, in America at telling the world what's so wrong that the world doesn't even know what's so good about God. Amen? We've been so great at telling the world what, is, what sucks about their life. Can we tell the world what's so great about God? Amen? He's a good, good father. 
He says, taste and see that I am good. He's all, all these great things about God. And we've shamed people out of coming to Christ from not coming to Christ because we tell them all the bad things that they're doing. I'm going to promise you this. I know this. I've never met anyone that was so wrapped up in sin that did not know they were doing something wrong. In fact, you're sitting here this morning, many of us. You've done something this week. You know you did it. You know it was wrong. Right? The moment you did it. And if you didn't know it was wrong, it was maybe because you're not a Christian. But anybody who's ever said, Lord, please come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. And has any kind of walk with God at all. You know when you've slipped up. You know when that, that blind spot, you didn't see it. You know. Some, so, so some super religious saint comes up to you. Boy, I told you. It's okay to correct, but it's also even greater to love and encourage. Amen? I mean, I did. I disciplined my boys growing up. They got, they got spankings. But every time they did, they also got loved. They, I sat down with them. My wife and I sat down with them. This is why we spanked you. This is what you did. And this is what we're going to do. And we want to encourage you to be different in this area of your life. Amen? Because I grew up in a, in a family when I got a spanking because I said so. Well, I never understood what that meant. I don't know why, I was, why that was wrong. Amen? We have to encourage our family. We have to encourage our friends. We have to encourage our church family. Look, I mean, I, there's people that stayed home today because it's raining, but when you see folks in, in this church that's not been here, don't make them feel bad for not being here. They know they've not been here. Well, we ain't seen you in church in a month. Well, duh. You think that's a revelation to them? <laughs> hey, I know I haven't seen you in a couple weeks. I just wanted to touch base with you. You okay? Is there something we can pray with you about? Amen. What's, what's God saying to you right now in your life? There's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to expose blind spots. Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be leaving, and they were probably like, oh, yeah, right. He had a relationship with his disciples, and he's like, guys, I'm leaving. Someone greater than me is going to come. The Holy Spirit's going to come. But they, pro they probably was taking Jesus' words for granted. What do you mean you're leaving? You've been with us. They were probably assuming that he would walk with them physically for the rest of their lives. Well, they, he said, I'm leaving. And then when he left, golly, they kind of went chaotic, didn't they? <clears throat> Some people's biggest regrets in life is not saying what they really wanted to say to that person they have a relationship with. We have blind spots. Another area we have blind spots is financially. How many of you have ever made a budget? You set a budget for your finances. And you check your phone. I have an app. I bank with Capital One. And I check it daily. And the other day, I thought I had more money than I really did. What I had forgot about was the automatic withdrawal that comes from Liberty Mutual. Like, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't thinking that $239 was coming out this week. Blind spot. So now you got to try to maneuver things. You got to try to fix things. Lord, I tithe and I did this and I did that. Yeah, but you didn't make. You weren't. You didn't plan right. We all have those blind spots financially, right? And so we have to. How do we help ourselves? How do we understand our finances better? How do we get them in check? I mean, many of us in this room have debt, and we, we're we're consumed by debt. And there's oftentimes there's more month there's more month than there is money, right? And you have, there's more bills than there is money in your account. And so, when it comes to money, how do we have these blind spots? Well, first of all, we've got to understand something this morning. It is not your money. Three people agreed with me. Would you have the money you have if it wasn't for God, the Jehovah Jireh, your provider, who provided it? Right? It is not your money. We have blind spots when it comes to our money. We're like, it's my money, and I want it now. 
money, money, money. My money, my possessions, my stuff. I worked for this. It's mine. I'm about to go. I, I keep seeing posts from people. I got to go get this grind. I got to go get this money. I got to get that paper. Come on. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money is the root. The love of money is the root of all evil. And so <clears throat> we get prideful sometimes with our money. And uh, I just look at this big boat I just bought. Look at this. I just did this. I did that. I got that. You didn't get Jack. Amen. If I, you know what, I've been broke as it broke like nobody's business, and I still had Jesus, and I still had everything provided for. I'm just a little bit further than broke like nobody's business, and I still have everything provided for. Amen. It's about blind spots. It's about exposing them. It's about seeing this and that, and trying to make sure your finances are in order. And so we get to this place where we think we never have enough. We have this scarcity mentality. And I'm going to tell you, so those of us that are going to Nicaragua, there's been such a battle with many people and even on our team. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go because I got all this anxiety and I, got, I don't know how I'm going to raise all this money. It's God's will. It's God's bill. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. I'm going to tell you, I don't have $4,500 for me and my three boy, two boys to go. I just don't have it. But this last week, a pastor called me and he said, Pastor, can you, Jack, can you meet me in Lake Charles? I want to pay, pay for you to play golf. I'm like, praise God, you're paying for me to play golf? Hallelujah. Because I was like, when I got there, I'm like, bro, I'm glad you, you said you were paying because I'm trying to save money for Nicaragua. And then so we're, pay, we're playing golf. He actually uh, bought me this little club membership thing to play there. Pretty cool course. And when we're done, he's like, Jack, really and truthfully, I just wanted to hang out with you because I wanted to give you this check so you and your boys could go to Nicaragua. Are you just kidding me? You paid for me to play golf and you're giving me money to go to Nicaragua? Hallelujah. They say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Uh-uh, take me golfing. <laughs> and give me some money. Amen. <laughs> but then we also, when it comes to our finances, we have a tendency to rob from God. Oh, pump them brakes, Pastor. Robbing from God, Malachi 3. How, do, how have you robbed from God? We're to bring 10% of our earnings and give it to the Lord, amen? Tithes and offerings, tithes. And let me just explain something. Your offering is not your tithe. Your offering is above and beyond what your tithe is. Well, pastor, tithing is Old Testament. Okay, let's go New Testament. They gave everything they had. You want to sell all your possessions and give your home to somebody? They gave all they had. I love when people tell me that. Oh, no, tithing is just Old Testament. Great. Empty your checking account and your savings account and give it to the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we, when we refuse to tithe, how many of you would ever do this? Get on your knee. Lord, I love your word, but I do not agree with tithing. But bless me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Did anybody ever do that? No. I, if, you, if you have the guts to do that, whoo, you got some problems. How about blind spots? Blind spots in our finances. Accountants don't understand it. When, we, when you do your taxes and they say, we don't understand how you made this amount of money, but you gave this amount of money away. They don't understand it. The math doesn't add up. God is saying, look, I'm going to let you live on 90%, and you will do so much better with 90% than you ever did with 10. That's what he's saying. We must give to him what he asks. I'm, I'm doing so, I'm doing so, and, and when we do that, when we give to him what he's asked, he says, I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll pour out a blessing. If we don't, we will always struggle. I'll get into, I'll preach on tithing one Sunday, but I told this lady one time, I told this church that we were pastoring, and I've always lived by this. Someone come to me, this was an older lady in the church in Cincinnati that we pastored. She said, 
She was struggling. And I told her, I told the church, I made this statement that I'm about to make right now. But Brother Bill, don't get discouraged. Don't get upset. Okay, I know you're the treasurer of the church, but I want to hear an amen, all right? I said to the church, I said, if you will, pro- if you will practice tithing off of what God gives you, if you'll practice tithing 10% for the next six months and be a good steward of everything God's given you, and if during that six-month period you cannot pay your bills, bring me your bills and the church will pay them. I had one, old, one older lady. I loved her to pieces. She used to make me cakes, little cakes every morning, every Sunday. Awesome cakes. She came to me and she said, Pastor, I'm taking you up on your offer. I can't pay my gas bill, but I've been tithing. I was okay. So I went to Sister Chris. Uh, Pennington, I said, hey, has Sister Goble been tithing 10%? Yeah, from what I can see, she's tithed every week. I said, okay. I said, Sister Goble, I'd like for you to bring your bills to my office, and we're going to sit down, we're going to look at where you're spending your money. Didn't take me long. I'm not a rocket scientist. A widow, older lady, had no business paying $200 a month to Dish Network. Hello. Amen? And then I found out she was paying other things over and above than what she should have been. I said, Sister Goble, if we just, I'm talking, I said, hell, I told you if you were tithing and a good steward, and I'm not blaming you, but your budgeting is off here. Do you watch 200 and some odd channels every day? No, Pastor, I only watch three. Okay, well, let me call Dish Network for you right now. Get to them on the phone because you're about to save $175 a month. Do you think you could pay your gas bill by cutting that out? Yeah, Pastor, I could. Okay, so it's not God's fault. Amen? God still honors his word. And he gave me eyes to look at your bill and see where you're overpaying. He just provided for you. Amen? So I still stand on that principle. Number four. We have to remove the blind spots. Friends, we're in war. Um, Jolie, can I have uh, my toy right there, please? Will you bring my, I got my lovely assistant right here. I just need one of them. We have to remove the blind spots. Friends, we're in a war. We're in a war. Do you not know that every single day there is a battle going on for your soul? There is a battle going on for your life every single day. We have to remove the blind spots. There is a battle for your life that is raging. Scripture says in Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Scripture also says, No weapon formed against you will prosper. What it doesn't say is that there hasn't been a weapon formed. There has been a weapon formed against you. You can bet that. There's a weapon formed against each and every one of you. That's why we're to put on the the whole armor of God. There has been a weapon fashioned, formed, with a laser target missile launched, ready to launch to try to take you out. But I'm going to tell you something this morning. The devil is shooting Nerf bullets. Right? Because he can sit here and he can cock this all he wants to. At the end of the day, it's still a Nerf bullet. It might hit you, but it's not going to take you out. So why are we falling and bowing and, and caving into a Nerf bullet? The fiery darts of the enemy, yeah, they keep coming. And the weapons, of our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're going to blame everybody else, and we're fighting this fight and that fight. But my fight's not against people. And he has formed a weapon against me, and he's formed a weapon against you. But come on, I've got on a breastplate of righteousness. I've got my shield of faith. And I don't know if you've ever watched that movie, 300. But I love that part in the movie where they kneel down and they put their shield in front of the person next to them. One solid army. And back to Caleb's vision. As we're in a circle together. And we have our shields of faith and we're walking, we're marching forward as children. We're marching, we're headed to Zion. Amen? 
If you're old enough, you've been in the church, the assemblies long enough, remember I, we are Christ ambassadors? Yeah. When I was in first in youth group, we were Christ ambassadors. Then we changed our name to something else, but come on. We, there is a war, and, there, and we've got a, and sometimes there's people, even some of you this morning, you're here in this service. Can I tell you this morning, you don't have to fight by yourself. Some of you may have been in this battle, in this fight, and you're like, I'm so tired, I don't know what to do. I can't fight this anymore. Well, it's time to surrender and let someone else stand in the gap and fight for you. Amen? Let other people fight for you until you are strong enough to actually start to fight for yourself and then fight for other people. How many of you have, uh, what's the name of uh, that movie, the, the guy who was, didn't use a weapon in war? Saul Ridge, man, that's, that movie is so incredible to me. He, he went, he didn't use a weapon. And he, his, he was trying to save all those guys. They'd been injured in battle. And everyone else with the weapons had already went down the wall and went back to safety. And he's like, just get one more. I just got to get one more. God, give me the strength just to get one more. My goodness, if that's not the body of Christ right there, I don't know what is. I'm not, I'm not naive and I'm not ignorant to the fact that there are those sitting in our service even this morning. And our, we look good with our clothes and we put on a good face, but come on, inside, internally, we're fighting, we're struggling. Our smiles are, are superficial and we're just trying. I'm trying. Can I tell you some of the biggest words that the enemy loves to put in our mouth is, I'm trying. God didn't call you to try. He called you to be a victor. We've got to quit trying and start doing and being. And if you are here this morning and you're so weak that you can't be, then let someone else who's already being pull you along the side and say, you know what, we're coming to this altar not by ourselves. We're coming together. I'm going to fight with you. Amen? Because there is a war. And I'm going to tell you, as we're preparing, you think, I'm going to tell you right now, heaven's gates and hell's flames, I don't plan stuff and do stuff just so we can say we had an event. Everything I do, I ask myself, what's the fruit from it? What is, what's, how the, how's the kingdom going to be ex- advanced? And what is God going to do through it? And as we're preparing and we're believing God for this next week for 300 souls, I'm going to tell you right now, the enemy is mad and he's attacking and he wants to derail and take everybody out. So that's why we're doing a week of prayer and fasting. I'm not praying and fasting just so our church is full. There are people coming in here next week who don't know Jesus, and we're going to fight for their souls. Amen? Fight for their souls. We're in a war. You'll never win a spiritual battle using physical tactics. Look at 2 Corinthians verse 10, or chapter 10, verse 3 and 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy strongholds. Destroy. How many of you like to tear up stuff? Man, give me a sledgehammer, I'll go to work. Destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Satan is an accuser of the brethren. He's creating lies about you. We need to stop believing those lies. He's the father of lies. We need to recognize who is at work. We need to recognize that it's him. He is attacking you, and he's coming along your blind spots. Friends, God is a shield about you. He is a shield about you. He is the lifter of your head. David prayed, search me, try me, and see if there are any wicked way in me. He prayed, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. This morning, I'm going to ask our worship team to come. We're going to partake of communion here in a a few moments. But before we do, let's take care of business, okay? I want to ask you, if you would, to stand to your feet. We just close our eyes for a moment.
First and foremost, you're here this morning. You've never asked Christ, Jesus, the Lord of, the Lord of all. You've never asked Him to be Lord of your life. You've never said, Lord, I surrender. I want to invite you to be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to take control. And this morning, that blind spot's been exposed, and you want to make that decision today, that you want to make your life different, starting today by accepting Christ. If that's you, I want to ask you to just raise your hand. Awesome. Praise God. I'm not saying this just to be saying this, but there's someone in this room this morning. You've actually been entertaining the thought of suicide. You think your life doesn't matter. And this morning, God's saying, I see that blind spot. And he wants you to know he loves you so much. And we'd love an opportunity to pray with you, to talk to you help you know how much you're appreciated and you're loved suicide is not a way the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy Jesus come to give life more abundantly so if you're here this morning and you say pastor I have some blind spots in my life I see them this morning I have some blind spots I, mean, I know I'm sure they're there but I don't see them I just want the Holy Spirit to reveal to me some of those blind spots. I've isolated myself. I pulled myself away from others because I sometimes I think I can handle this on my own. But this morning, I don't want to be secluded. I don't want to live in seclusion and walk in seclusion. I want to be. I want. I need community. I need friends. I need people of God to come alongside of me. And help me see these blind spots in my life so that when the enemy comes, I'm not taken by surprise. If that's you, I want to ask you to raise your hand. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. We all need it. Well, let me ask this. And this is going to get bold because I'm, I'm not going to play games with God. I'm not going to play games with the enemy. If you're here this morning and you say, I got it all figured out, raise your hands. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So come on. When I count to three, if you don't got it all figured out, we're going to do something. We're going to engage. Amen? Well, you're not going to make me do anything, Pastor. Well, that's rebellion, and that's not in the house tonight, this morning. Amen? So I'm going to count to three. Lord, I'm not ready. I'm still going to count to three. I'm going to engage. And on three, I'm throwing both my hands up because I need help. I'm the pastor of this church, and I have blind spots. I need help. One, God, I remove pride right now in Jesus' name. I repent of my ways. Search me and try me. Two, God, I don't have this all figured out. I need people to help me. And three, I'm surrendering to you today, God. I'm asking you to move and have your way in me. Place people in my life, not necessarily people I choose, but that people you were wanting in my life to speak into my life, to help me to see these blind spots because the enemy may come in and try to steal, kill, and destroy. But God, I don't want to be destroyed. I don't want my marriage destroyed. I don't want my kids destroyed. I don't want my finances destroyed. I don't want my walk with God destroyed. Oh, Jesus, what a beautiful name. Come on, surrender. Just surrender. Come on, and I, wish, I wonder if you will become the prayer team this morning. I wonder if you'll partner with the people next to you and around you and form those circles like we had that vision of and just say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to stand here in agreement with my brother and my sister. I'm going to be their shield just as you are our shield. 
Uh, well, but pastor, I'm, uh, I'm not comfortable doing that. You will, be not, you will not be comfortable when you get wrecked either. I'd rather have that surround me now than have to need it later. Come on, get around some people. Everybody, let's go. Get around some people. 